time to ditch the excuses. Get up, get out, and shut the f*** up. This is the Adjusting to Six Figures podcast. All right, everybody, we're live. This is the next episode of, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to, we're putting a name to this thing. And I'm going to go back. So as you know, maybe you'll be listening. So we've got sort of a mixed bag of uh, listeners here. We have listeners that tune in because they found us by a guest that came on, or you might be a listener that's involved in um, my industry in the independent insurance adjusting industry. So you might find these podcasts and you're like, what the hell is this? So these podcasts are, are just for the independent insurance adjusters that are out there listening. All right, and what I do here, um, I just talk insurance adjusting. And some particularly, I talk about some of the um, issues that are raised inside of our Facebook group, uh, the Claims Adjuster Success Network. So if you're an independent insurance adjuster and you're not a part of our Facebook group, uh, check out the Claims Adjuster Success Network Facebook group. It's the best Facebook group that's out there when it comes to independent insurance adjusting. Why is it the best? Well, it's the best because we're not a bunch of assholes, you know? There's a lot of people in uh, Facebook groups that are very uh, ill-spirited, negative, pessimists. Uh, They don't respond very nicely to new people. They don't like questions that they see as dumb. And uh, because of that, they create a very toxic environment. And we don't do that at the Success Network. We're about positive, forward-thinking insurance adjusters, insurance professionals that are there to help other people. So go, if that's you, if you're not an asshole, if people genuinely like you, um, go on over to the Claims Adjuster Success Network Facebook group, try to get you in there as quick as possible. Now, one of the things that happen when you get loaded, when you fill out the questionnaire, it's going to ask you, what is, uh, what, 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 what's something, what's your biggest struggle going on? And uh, that question, uh, your answer to that gets fed to me in a, uh, in a Google sheet. So I get to see that. And if it's uh, framed in a good enough way, we get to talk about it on this podcast right here. And that's what it's all about. So here's what we're going to do. We don't really have a name for this podcast. We've only done it a couple times. So we're going to relive what this podcast, the Adjusting to Six Figures podcast, what it was originally. It was called the Adjuster Cast podcast. We were just going to talk about insurance adjusting. And I didn't really want to do that with this podcast. So we called it the uh, Adjusting to Six Figures podcast. So um, what we're going to do for these particular episodes, we're going to call it the Adjuster Cast, and we're going to divide it up like that. This episode of the Adjusting to Six Figures podcast has been brought to you by Adjuster University. If you've ever been in a car accident or a major medical procedure, then you've probably encountered a claims adjuster before, but probably never thought much of it. I know I didn't, until I found out that there was a little bit more to the job of a claims adjuster than what met my eye. Now, while there's claims adjusters that are salaried by the insurance carriers, those insurance carriers are also supported by a team of freelancers. These freelancers act as independent contractors that help the insurance carrier facilitate their claims to keep their customers happy. These freelancers are called independent adjusters. Independent adjusters don't work for the insurance carriers, they work for themselves. That means they get to set their own schedule and decide what type of work they want to do. Best of all, independent adjusters, especially the ones that are interested in traveling across the country, can earn over a quarter of a million dollars a year as an independent insurance adjuster. This is not network marketing. This is not an affiliate program. There's no pyramid involved. This is just a super niche industry that few people actually know about. And this is not a get rich quick scheme. This is a get rich over a long period of time combined with hard work and commitment. If you're looking for some easy way to make six figures a year or even over a quarter of a million dollars a year without having to do much work or put in much effort, then this definitely isn't for you. But if you feel like you're a hard worker and you can get started running your own small business as an independent insurance adjuster, then this is the program for you. If this sounds like something that you're ready to commit to or even just learn a little bit more about, then head over to adjuster-university.com forward slash get started to sign up to our next introductory class. Once again, that is adjuster-university.com forward slash 
get started and sign up to a free introductory class so that you can learn more about this niche industry called independent insurance adjusting. So, without further ado, let's smash these out because usually, usually I like, like to keep these in little tiny bits. All right, so Joshua. Joshua asked, didn't even ask a question. Joshua's over here. Joshua said, I'm just starting out. <clears throat> I'm legitimately afraid of Xactimate. Well, if you are somebody like me, your field property adjuster, a large part of what we do is working inside of Xactimate. That is where we will spend most of our time. Probably most of our time is working inside of that software. It's one of the most important pieces of software that you could possibly learn. And it's important because the better at that software you are, the more valuable of a person you are. What do I mean by that? By knowing this software, by knowing how to use the software and knowing how to use it properly. And by using it properly, I mean how to estimate for property damage properly. If you have the mind to be able to go inside of a building, look at damage, and then be able to accurately transcribe what you visibly saw into this piece of software called Xactimate, you are not only valuable to the companies that you work with as an independent insurance adjuster and those companies being independent adjusting firms, you're not only valuable to them, you are also valuable to restoration companies, you're also valuable to roofers, to general contractors, you're valuable to public adjusters, you possess a skill a skill that does not need to be within the confines of independent insurance adjusting. It does not. Not only that, but now you can also act as an appraiser. When, uh, when claims go through the appraisal process, they need somebody who's going to be able to write up an estimate. Whether you're on the policyholder side or you're on the insurance carrier side, you need to know Xactimate. It is extremely, extremely important. So, being afraid of Xactimate, that's fine. If you're afraid of Xactimate, it only tells me one thing, that you're afraid because you don't know. We're afraid of what we don't know, right? That's the saying. And if you don't know Xactimate, it's going to be, um, it's going to create fear in you. Well, if you don't know something, what's the first thing you need to do? Learn it. Figure it out. Okay, so you need to figure out Xactimate so you can build that confidence. We just did a podcast. It should be the podcast right before here. Uh, right before this podcast. Great podcast. If, if you haven't listened to it, jump back, check out the podcast by Rory Douglas. Okay. During that podcast, he mentioned something and it's, and it's stuck with me ever since he mentioned what he called the three C's. Okay. <clears throat> the three C's, it comes from consistency, confidence, and courage. So let me apply that to this statement that Joshua put in. If you're afraid of Xactimate, you need to learn it. Now, in order to learn Xactimate, you need to be consistent with it. So you need to get some sort of training program. You need to get some sort of real life experience with it. You need to start using it. You need to use it on a consistent basis. I am fantastic on Xactimate, but part of that, I say part of it, but all of that is because I use Xactimate on a very consistent basis. And as we all know, Time is money. So the faster, more efficient, and more effective that I am at Xactimate, the more money I will make. And boy, I love making money. So I'm going to learn what I need to learn so that I can be fast at it. And the only way that I can learn that is through consistency. If you're getting work, that's a great way to learn that consistency, to build that consistency. If you're not getting work and you're in the beginning stages, like it sounds like you are, Joshua, if you do not have that work to practice on, you need to be a part of a great training system, okay? Xactimate Gold Training Suite. It's on Adjuster University. It not only takes you through all the things to get level three certified, it also takes you through actual estimate building using photographs that were captured while you were in the field. Is it pricey? Absolutely. Should I be charging more for it? 1,000% I should be, but it's up there. If you're not happy with the price and you want to do something else, that's fine. Do something else. But the point is to do it because you need that consistency because that consistency will bring you courage ultimately. That consistency will bring you through there and you need to get that. So let's see. Um, 
So one, one thing um, I just want to add to that, that is not bound by just Xactimate. A lot of people struggle in this industry and several other industries because they get stuck with something that they don't know. They encounter something that they don't know and they stop and they don't know what to do and they're just at a dead stop. There is an answer to every problem that's out there. The question is, the real question is, is whether you are willing to invest the time and or money to figure it out. So biggest struggle that somebody has, Felix. Felix chimed in. His biggest struggle is maintaining licenses for various states. Yeah, it's a struggle. It's a struggle, all right. Here's my question for you, though. How many of those states are you actively working in? And I know, as an independent adjuster, you're going to get licenses in states so that you have better marketability, so that you can tell different companies that you're already licensed in that state. I get it. What I will also say, though, is that many, most, almost all, really, independent insurance companies are not um, tracking what, acts, what licenses you have that are active. They're not. Some are, the big ones are, but the medium size and the small ones, they are not. So if you're marketing yourself to the smaller companies, it really doesn't matter. Just tell them that you're willing to go across the U.S. Most of these, for instance, I have a Texas license, I got a Florida license, I, I maintain licenses to the states that I know I consistently work in. I don't have, at this moment, an Oklahoma license. Oklahoma gets hail, though. If there is a hail event in Oklahoma and I want to go to Oklahoma, I'll get an Oklahoma license. Now, not only will I get that license, but now I have something to talk about. Now I'll go to the, the companies that either I know are in Oklahoma or I'll, or I'll reach out to all the companies that I normally market myself to and I'll let them know, hey, I'm over here. I got this license. I know, I've know i got my reputation. I know what I'm talking about. I got the residential hail certification. I adjust to you, blah, blah, blah. I... I just, I heard about the hailstorm. I've got the license. If you need help, I'm boots on the ground. Or I may even tell them I'm already on my way there. Whatever the case is. Maintaining these licenses, especially if you're not working very consistency, consistently, is dangerous. It's dangerous to do that sort of stuff. So my advice is only hold the licenses that you know you're probably going to use or in the states that you really want to visit. After that, I don't personally see the benefit of it. Let them reach out to you or you reach out to them when you hear of a hail event or a hurricane event, something like that, and just get the licenses as you need them. Okay. So we got a very basic question here. You've heard it uh, time and time again. Um, from Lissandra, Lissandra, Lissandra. Lissandra comes in and asks, as a newbie, um, she's a newbie and trying to get the first deployment. How many times have we heard that? So if you're a new adjuster and you are fighting and fighting and fighting to get that first deployment, man, it's tough. It's tough because you don't know what you're doing. You don't have a formula. You don't know the recipe on how to get on those deployments. And those deployments are huge because it's those deployments that really put the money in the bank. Everybody knows that. Nobody really talks about the money that daily adjusters make. And by daily adjusters, I mean the insurance adjusters that are just working their home territory day in and day out. Nobody really talks about that, although that's an extremely sexy thing to do because I've been mostly a daily adjuster my entire career and I've, I gross over a quarter of a million a year as a daily adjuster. Uh, people only want to talk about the cat adjusting because it's a, you know, it's a big event. It's uh, you know, it's on the news and it's just generally sexy and you can make a lot, you can make more money. you got the volume, you have more damage. You can make more money doing that. So she wants to know as an oob, uh, as a newbie, um, she's asking about how to get, how to get her first deployment, man, to get your first deployment. It's, almost the same it's the same recipe as getting your second deployment 
getting your third deployment. As you go down, as, as you go through the years and you've had successful deployment after successful deployment, you may find yourself um, just getting phone calls. So you don't have to do much work. But listen, those first couple, you're going to have to follow the same formula, most likely. Market, 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 sell, sell, sell. What are you marketing? Your services. What are you selling? Yourself. That's it. If they don't know you, they're not going to do business with you. Extremely simple concept here. Obscurity is the death of business. You need to fight obscurity at all ends. How do you fight obscurity? You got to get in front of them. You get in front of them by any means necessary. Phone calls, emails, knock on their door, send them a letter, send them a gift package. Who's them? Your potential clients. You got to do whatever it is you can possibly do in order for them to see your name, in order for them to see your face. I tell everybody time and time again, there are two reasons, two reasons why some independent adjusters are not getting the work that they want to get. Everything can boil down to two reasons, no matter what. Either they are not marketing themselves well enough or they are not marketing themselves to enough people. Every single problem, 100% fall within those two categories. Now, when I say not marketing yourself well enough, that's the one that gets a little bit compl complicated. What is marketing yourself well enough? Well, marketing yourself well enough also includes where you live. If you are living in super, super rural Nebraska, but you're only willing to travel out 15 miles, well, listen, you've got bad, that's bad marketing. That's bad ad copy, okay? You're not solving very many people's problems with that marketing. You're, you need to say, hey, listen, if, if you are tied down to Nebraska and you're not going to move no matter what, then you need to expand your marketing and say, hey, listen, I'm willing to go the entire state. I'll do whatever needs to be done. I'll handle the scheduling. Don't you worry about scheduling and routing. I handle the entire state. And you handle the entire state. Because then you can market to more people. Everything comes down to those two issues. How many people you should be marketing to? Well, that's a mathematical question there. How many can you market to? How many companies are there? <clears throat> Very simple question. How many people you should, be mar should you market yourself to? How many rosters should you be on? Well, I could give you that answer, but the first thing that you'll have to figure out is how many companies they actually are. How many people are your potential client, your potential customer? Once you figure out that answer, that's the number of companies you should be marketing yourself to. We got a list. We sell it uh, on Adjust University inside of a package. I think you can get it separately, but you can get a becoming a six-figure adjuster package where you get that list and you get a bunch of other marketing stuff. So what else we got? Monica. Monica chimes in. Learning about construction is her biggest struggle. That's a big one. When I started, I knew a little bit of construction. It helped a little bit. But mostly this was all new to me. There were certain things I knew. I knew how to patch holes. I knew how to do demo. I knew how to hang drywall. I knew how to paint some like, you know, light stuff. But most of the stuff that I see as an adjuster day to day, this is not stuff I'm familiar with. I didn't know about water damage or anything like that. So learning construction is certainly the biggest issue that you have. But here's the, here's the great thing. Most of the claims that, you, if not every single one <clears throat> of the claims that you walk into are not going to be unique whatsoever. They're, in fact, they're going to be pretty unremarkable. And I say that knowing that when you get out there, the homeowner is probably going to be very upset and that it's going to be very new to them and they may think that this is like life chain you know life threatening damage and their entire life has been upended blah 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 
But odds are, whatever happened to their house happened to somebody else. In fact, it probably happened to tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people in the last couple of years. Since the beginning of time, who knows? So, <clears throat> why do I bring that up? Well, because we have a thing called YouTube. And the way YouTube works is that people want clicks, they want views, and so people will instruct you how to do certain things on there. And one thing that is huge is home repair. So, if you don't know enough about construction, I encourage you to watch some videos on there. And they will do DIY. You'll find videos for DIY, how to actually make the repairs yourself. Educate yourself on how to actually perform the repair as if it's something that happened inside of your house. One of the most common claims that you'll get as an independent insurance adjuster is a water claim. A pipe burst, water heater busted, stuff like that. So if a pipe broke in a ceiling cavity, they may have, uh, you may check it out, there might be a stain on there. And the water ensued from that ceiling, accumulated over the hardwood floor, caused the hardwood floor to buckle. That hardwood floor goes throughout the entire first floor. So think about it. You got two issues. You got the ceiling and you got the floor, right? Well, look up on YouTube how to, how to fix a water-damaged ceiling. I'm sure you'll get more than a few videos on that. How to patch a ceiling. How to reinstall drywall. Questions like that. Maybe it's plaster. Whatever the case is. There's going to be a solution for that. And you need to watch that video and understand a couple things. You need to understand the process in which they're doing. And you need to understand the materials that they're using. You need to be able to properly identify the materials that are being used. Once you know that, then it just comes down to accurately transcribing it inside of the estimating software that you're using. It could be Xactimate, could be something else. But if you're using Xactimate, each line item that you put in there is going to have a description of that line item. You read that description and you make sure that everything that you saw is being one way or another accounted for in your estimate. And you do the same thing with the hardwood floor. Do you need to replace all the hardwood floor? Read some material. How to fix a water, da water damaged hardwood flooring. Do you have to replace all of it? Or can you just replace certain areas and sand the rest down? Are there different types of hardwood floor? How do you tell the different types of hardwood floor? These are all questions that there are answers to very accessibly. They're in reach. You just got to look for it. So another one we've got, Howard chimed in. Networking is his biggest struggle. I can take care of the networking thing real fast because Howard has already made a great move in the networking front. And that is uh, by becoming a member of the Claims Justice Success Network. That's a means for networking right there. You can join other Facebook groups too, which I also encourage. Join a bunch. You'll notice that it's a little bit better in our group, but join a bunch because you'll be able to see what other people are complaining about and see what other people hopefully are succeeding in. Other than that, there's a couple notable conventions that you can attend every year. Um, PLRB is a very big one and I particularly like PLRB uh, because it is not limited to just insurance adjusters there's a lot of other vendors that go there it's a great opportunity for you to meet people outside of our specific niche and while also meeting people inside of it PLRB they have one large one every year and then they do some smaller regional ones as well I don't know what their uh, calendar is like now um, in light of COVID, but go check it out. Another big one is NACA, N-A-C-A, -A, typically held inside of Vegas <clears throat> at the head of the year. Um, that you'll find a few vendors in there. It's a little bit smaller, but you'll also uh, be exposed to a lot more independent insurance adjusters there. That's a great one. Now, other than that, there's also one that I particularly like called Windstorm, W-I-N-D, Storm. And that is typically in the Orlando, Florida area or Florida in general. That one, you will be exposed to more public adjusters, contractors, storm contractors, and things like that. Which, even if you are a staff adjuster, independent adjuster, whatever the case, you're working on the insurance company side, it's still a fantastic place to go to. Because again, just like any other networking opportunity, it is a means for you to gain perspective. 
And in that case, in the windstorm case, you are gaining perspective from the other side, from the side that is most often referred to as the adversary. You get to be a part of that. It is a fantastic place to be a part of. Cookie chimed in. You just said being new. Biggest struggle is being new in the industry. Listen, all of us, all of us were new. Everybody in the claims business was new at one point. What's wrong with being new? It's nothing wrong with being new. What's wrong is not knowing what to do. What's wrong is being a licensed adjuster for months at a time and still talking about how you still never gotten any work. That's the problem. And that's what you need to fight against. So if you're new, listen, you got two, two ways to go about this. I'll break it down real easy. If you're a new independent insurance adjuster, you got two ways. You got two, two strategies. You got the DIY strategy. Now there's a pro, big pro to the DIY strategy. DIY strategy is it's free or low cost. Obviously, DIY means you're doing it yourself. You're learning everything yourself. Maybe you joined our success network and you're going to listen to people. You're going to make, ask some questions, but you're going to figure it out yourself. Hopefully, you get good advice. Hopefully, you don't get deterred by bad advice, but you're going to ultimately figure this thing out all on your own. Will you be able to figure it out on your own? Yeah, absolutely. I figured it out on my own for the most part. A lot of what I learned was from communicating with people at companies that I worked for. So you can do it too. But it took me a handful of years to really get to the level where I was actually making great money. I was making good money. But it took me a little while to make great money. And I think about how much of a better place I would have been in if there were somebody like me when I started. But back when I started, there were no online training companies. There were no gurus. Nobody was out there. Nobody was even talking about this. So I had to learn on my own. I didn't really have a choice. Even YouTube. YouTube wasn't even that big. But I figured it out. And over the years, it did well for myself. But my biggest thing, if you are committed to this and it's do or die for you and you know you're already sold on this business and you're going to do well for yourself, invest in yourself. Don't do it like me because I wouldn't do it like me again. When I'm dead, said and done in this business, if I go to another industry, dude, I'm investing in myself, man. I'm investing. I'm going to find someone. <clears throat> I'm going to find someone that knows whatever business I'm in and I will pay them whatever they want to learn it because I don't want to spend years. I don't have this time anymore. I don't want to spend years figuring things out. I want to fast forward. If I could, if I could give somebody $10,000 to tell me everything I need to know to take me through the last decade of their life, I'll do that gladly because I'll make that back tenfold in the first year. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to move ahead quick. I'm not trying to slow down. I'm trying to get this thing done. I'm trying to make money. I'm trying to make money today, not tomorrow. Today, so I can double it tomorrow. That's the mentality you have to have. So if you're new and you're just struggling, man, you got you to gotta find somebody that is in a position where you want to be and you need to consume. Consume as much as you possibly can can okay so let's uh let's get on the direction of somebody with a little bit <clears throat> more experience i can't pronounce the first name but i can pronounce the last name looks like uh miss beavers miss beavers chimed in and said that her biggest struggle is steady work and differences and requirements per carrier <clears throat> we're gonna wrap up on this one here so steady, we got two issues here, steady work. So let's talk about steady work real quick. So steady work, you're working, but you're not working consistently. So without knowing much about Miss Beavers, she could be a cat adjuster, 
or she could be working on a more daily basis. So if you are a CAD adjuster, it's going to be extremely difficult to find consistent work because your work is bound for the most part by something that is not consistent. Weather. The weather is not consistent. There is not a set number of hurricanes per year. There is not a set number of winter storms per year. There's not a set number of hailstorms per year. Environmental disasters. There's no set number to that. Is it unlikely that we will go a year without any major catastrophes? Yes. My point is, if you are looking for steady work, it is very difficult to do that as a catastrophe adjuster. So, absent of that, <clears throat> if you want consistent work, you need to be in the business of turning down work. You need to be in the business of turning down work because that is the only way that you can control the floodgate of work. You need to have a floodgate of work. If you don't require a floodgate of work, it's because not enough work is coming in. If not enough work is coming in, in order for you to say no to certain work, then you will easily fall in what people call a lull. And that lull is a gap when you are not getting any work. And that gap creates inconsistency. And that is when work no longer becomes steady. So the way to avoid that is by marketing, 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 making it so that you are getting a large number of phone calls every single month by different companies, phone calls, emails. You're getting communication one way or another by a large volume of companies, and you have to turn them down. Because by having to turn them down, that means that you are already at capacity. You need to have a wait list of companies that you're working with. And it might sound impossible, but I promise you, it's possible. We are surrounded by buildings. If you're a property adjuster, and I don't know what you are, Miss Beavers, but if you are a property adjuster, go outside of your house right now and look around. Unless you were in a super rural area, you're going to find other buildings. How far are you from the nearest grocery store? Go to that grocery store and look around. You're going to find buildings. These are all buildings where inevitably shit happens. And when shit happens, people don't want to pay for it. So when they don't want to pay for that, they call their insurance company. And when they call their insurance company, guess who the insurance company calls next? Adjusters. Whether staff or independent, they call adjusters to adjust the claim. The question is whether or not they're going to call you. And I can guarantee you they are not going to call you if you don't have your marketing in place, because if you don't have your marketing in place, if your marketing's not there, then they don't even know who you are. So you have got to get your marketing right. You've got to build a solid network of companies that look to you for assistance. When you become a resource to several companies, they will rely on you in your general area. And once they rely on you, you will have to start turning companies down. I turn companies down all the time. It's the greatest freaking thing I do. Now, the other thing that you have difficulty with is a difference in requirements per carrier. <clears throat> I think we just addressed this um, sometime lately. It is important. Big thing that you need to tackle is figuring out how you can provide the highest quality of work to the companies that you are working with while working with a high volume of companies in order for you to maintain a steady workflow, right? So here are my tips. As a field property adjuster, I think about what I look at frequently. I don't have a good memory and I can tell you that I don't care how good your memory is, it's not good enough. Obviously, there's a problem because if there's your biggest struggle is differences in requirements per carrier, that's because you're not able to just somehow remember it in your head. And that's fine because I can't either. And I don't think anybody can. If they can remember that, they're just not working for as many companies as they should be. They don't have the, the steady workflow 
or if they're not working, maybe they're working for one company, but they got a steady flow. But if that company dries up and they start, start giving their claims to somebody else, you're caught with your pants down and you're dead in the water. You got zero dollars coming in. But by diversifying with multiple streams, multiple companies that you're working with, it's a different story. So I think about what are the things that I look at the most? Because I want to know where I need to put my theoretical, meta, metaphorical post-it note. Okay? So I'm a field property guy. So I go out to a house, right? I got a clipboard. Okay. Well, can I put notes about each carrier on that clipboard? That's one way to do it. I could do that. But what I actually do, if you go over to adjusteruniversity.com, you may be able to find on there. I'm not even sure something called the uh, field adjusters assessment packet. Now what that is, let's say I receive a claim through Xactimate or I created a, an assignment inside of Xactimate. I use the template documents feature to open up a word document. And when I open up that word document, it populates a lot of key information about this particular assignment, the insured's name, their address, things like that. It automatically populates it up. It's a, it's a Word document that's specific to that independent and adjusting company and that insurance carrier because they all may be different, different combinations. You could be working for the same uh, insurance carrier with multiple different IA companies, right? So I'll have unique Word documents for each of those combinations. So if there is a field requirement, something that I need to know, remind myself of while I'm out there on the field, I make sure that I type that in to that template. I have a section that's just for that, just for things for me to remember when I'm out in the field. Maybe it's to hand the policyholder a um, survey. Maybe it's to do a field checklist of some sort. Maybe it's to take photographs of each directional elevation of, of the building, regardless of whether or not the claim is indoors or outdoors. These are, that's where I put this. So I get my field work done. Now, what's the next thing that I most likely will encounter where I need to know the requirements per carrier? Those are the estimating guidelines. Those are the things that I need to know for the estimate. When to apply O&P. What trades not to apply O&P to. How to depreciate. Things like that. So how do I remember that? What can I put in place that's going to be in front of me every single time? What I do, I use my macro. So every estimate that I write, I use the macro, the six-figure macro. It's inside of the uh, Xactimate Gold Training Suite. But you can use whatever you want. You should use the six-figure macro because of the immense additional benefits behind it. But here's essentially what it is. It is a sample estimate inside of Xactimate. So when I have an assignment open, I go to... I go to copy from project, and I dump in the sample estimate. Now, what this does, <clears throat> it gives me a grouping tree. It organizes my estimate based on exterior, interior, the different levels of the house, and it also has folders that have my line items already in there. So the folder has other line items for the dry rooms, it, you know, it'll have my commonly used roofing items. It'll have my commonly used elevation. It'll have my commonly used living room, bedroom sort of line items. And it'll have my commonly used bathroom line items. But then underneath that, I'll, I'll create new folders. And those folders, the names of those folders are simply my notes. I'll put in there 75% maximum depreciation. I'll put on there what not to depreciate. I'll put on there what line items, um, you know, maybe I shouldn't use or something like that. I'll put those notes on there because now I'm looking at it. I'm creating a fail stop. I'm getting something in front of me at the specific time that I need it. And it's extremely important. It's, a, it's, it's actually shocking to see how many people, independent insurance adjusters, are careless to the fact that they should be adhering to all the differences different insurance companies have. Failing to do so does not do anybody a benefit and it does not make the independent adjusting company that you're working with want to work with you anymore. 
Because if you fail to do that, they may complain. And if they complain, that is a point against that vendor, the independent insurance company, the independent adjusting company that you're working with. And if they get a complaint because of you, they need to make a business decision not to work with you anymore because you're terrible. So you are shooting yourself in the foot by not doing something to ensure that your estimates, your reports are of the highest quality and they need to be in the highest quality in order for you to continue getting work. And in order for them to be in the highest quality, you need to follow the rules of the people that are paying you. And you can easily do that by leaving notes for yourself. The question is, is figuring out where, but I just told you where. So that's going to be all for this episode of the AdjusterCast podcast. Hopefully you guys learned a thing or two in this one. And I hope to have you guys on future podcasts.